We're working really hard to achieve four goals at the same time. The first is to make the very best biochar. The second is to use as much of the process energy as possible. The third is to eliminate as many emissions as possible. And the fourth is to make the whole process as profitable as possible for everyone. biomass we put in, we get out carbon. This is how we really mean to take a bite out of our carbon footprint. Good stuff. Beautiful day, very glad to have you all here. I'm Bob Wells from New England Biochar in Massachusetts and representing Chargrow LLC in North Carolina. Our presentation today hopes to cover a lot of bases and we've got a lot of good information from several sources and then we'll also give you lots of time to ask questions and try to fill in the blanks. So we're excited that you're all here to experience this with us. We're certainly excited about biochar and what it can do for farmers, gardeners, and the whole world. We're going to do this a little bit backwards for a couple of reasons. I'm going to start by showing you how to make some biochar in your own backyard if you want to. Okay, and the reason I'm starting with this is because it takes a while and I want to make sure you can see the whole process. And then we'll go and talk about the details of biochar and start from the bottom and work our way up. But to start with, we're going to make this sort of biomass turn into this sort of biochar with this simple 55 gallon drum and a 30 gallon drum, which we affectionately call the Tin Man. So the way this works is we've got a barrel inside a barrel. And the reason I like to show you this whole system is that it really represents everything that we're doing on a much larger scale over there and you can do it on a much smaller scale and once you get into playing with this kind of stuff it's really fun and you can come up with your own designs there's a million different ways to do this all you have to do is look on YouTube and you'll see there's dozens and dozens of people trying different ways of doing it now there's four rules that I'm always preaching to everybody that I work with concerning biochar number one is we're gonna try and make the very best biochar that we can make and this is good biochar. There's a number of ways you can tell. You look inside and there's no brown inside. You look outside, there's no white on the outside. There's no ash. We've got really good pure char here. And that's not as easy as it looks. But I usually taste every batch to make sure it's good. No matter what it's made out of. Another, another good indicator with this that it's good char is you can listen to it. If it clinks when you drop it or move it, it sounds, you can hear the almost metallic or glassy like brittleness of it. If you don't hear that, it's probably not cooked enough. What's good char taste like? Good char, good question. Good char tastes like nothing, you can't taste it. Because like any good carbon filter, it's actually absorbing the things that you would be tasting. So it'll actually take taste out of things It'll take the smell out of things. It'll take the toxins out of things, just like a carbon filter. It's the same stuff, it's carbon. Number one was make the very best biochar. Number two, we're gonna use the energy that's available in the process, because in the process of making biochar, we are releasing a huge amount of energy that's coming out of that biomass that we're making the biochar out of. So we wanna make good use of that energy, if at all possible. And again, my real job here today is to inspire you to go and try it yourself and come up with new creative ways that you can use it for your own applications. There's lots of applications on farms and homes where we need energy. Everybody needs energy. 
we can offset the use of fossil fuels, hopefully, by using that energy in some good, useful way. Okay, that's number two. Number three, we're going to avoid as much pollution of any kind that we can, or doing any kind of environmental damage as, as uh, we can avoid. That's number three. The old way of making biochar, if you've ever seen the antique way they did it for many, many centuries, and they're still doing it in some countries, you'd get arrested if you tried to do it here, is make a big pile and get it smoldering. They'd cover that pile with wet leaves and, and earth and so forth and let it smolder in there and cook its way up through. In the process of doing that, you're releasing all the gases in the wood. The gases, i.e. smoke, are going into the atmosphere, making a huge amount of pollution. That smoke is the same fuel that we're going to use in this process to make it work. We're going to burn that smoke as much as we possibly can to avoid the pollution and to use the energy at the same time. So we're killing two birds with one stone right there. And hopefully you'll, you'll get an idea of how that's working here. Number four, we got to make it profitable. And I use the word profitable. I used to, I used to use the word we got to make money with it. And I've stretched it a little bit by saying we got to make it profitable because it doesn't necessarily have to be money that we're getting out of this, but we got to see that we're getting something good out of it or we're not going to do it. So either the profit is that we're helping the environment or the profit is we're making money or the profit is that you're growing better food, more nutrient dense food, whatever your profit is, you're helping your community. There's all kinds of profits that you can plug into number four. But if you don't have all four going for you, chances are you're not gonna, you're not gonna keep doing it. You're not gonna feel the full benefit of what biochar can give you. And so you're probably not gonna continue. So that's why I'm always trying to get people to see the whole picture. I was already talking to somebody this morning about that. They wanna see the whole picture here, the overall picture of why biochar is good. And it's, it's complicated for a very simple, almost purely carbon elemental stuff, the overall picture is actually quite complicated when you start studying it. And you have to get all the pieces to come together and that's what we're trying to do here. And this is really one of the best examples in the world of that happening. There's people all over the world trying to make those four rules work. Most of them don't even realize that there's four rules. They're trying to make one of those rules work. And to try and do one of them, you're going to screw up on the other three. And to try and do two of them, you're still going to not get the full benefit. So the four rules we're going to keep in mind all day, okay? This is what we call our inner retort chamber. Now retort just means to reburn. Just some half inch holes drilled in the bottom of this. This is a, th a 30 gallon drum. We're going to fill that with feedstock. There's nothing on the bottom drilled out on this one. Okay, the outside drum is sealed on the bottom. So the inside drum is sitting against that bottom. And we're gonna fill the inside drum with feedstock. Now we just happen to have really high class feedstock. This is, this is coming out of furniture factories. So it's, it's nice and dry hardwood. It's like the Cadillac of feedstock. At home, you're probably gonna have sticks and lumps and other things. And that'll work too. But it probably won't work with wood chips. Because if you fill that with wood chips, they don't breathe. And the gases will not escape well it'll insulate itself and you'll end up with a big brown spot in the middle that didn't get cooked. So think of, you can think of it as an oven. Now he put the top on there. If you want to see, it's just the inside barrel's full now, the outside barrel's not. Closed top on the inside barrel. Now we're going to fit more wood in here in the in-between spaces between these two barrels. Again, we're doing this with some 
some pretty high class feedstock here. Southern yellow pine in this case. <laughs> and we're filling in the annular space between the two. The drier the wood is that you're using, the better off you'll be in the end. We can fill in the spaces with this stuff. I'm usually using round sticks at home, not these beautiful cutoffs. You don't want to put any chemicals into the process here because any heavy metals, copper, stuff out of paint, that's all going to end up in your biochar. Now the, the stuff we're putting in now is the fuel that's going to heat the inside chamber. Now Abraham's going to start a fire on top here. We're always looking for waste products. We don't want to do this, if we can help it, in any way with new materials that we went out and gathered just for this. There's plenty of waste around that we can make biochar out of. And we can add that to our list of advantages is we're eliminating waste, which is a bigger advantage than meets the eye at first. Because if you study the carbon cycles of what's going on, even with wood chips, when you lay them on the ground, whether it's in the forest or in your backyard or in the dump, the county dump or whatever, this stuff is turning as it decays back into CO2 as well as methane. Methane as a greenhouse gas is 26 times worse than CO2. So any methane we can avoid is going to be better for the environment. By turning it into biochar, we're going to start sequestering that carbon that would be methane in the air. And we'll go into that in more detail when we go and sit down. So we'll get this fire going a little bit on top. And what's going to happen is it's going to burn down on the outside of, these, of the inside can. In between the cans, it's going to burn down through. We've got primary air holes down here. So our air is going to get sucked up in here and keep this fire going. It's, it's interesting that we're starting it on top and not on the bottom. If you start it on the bottom, it won't work. It's really kind of counterintuitive because we've all been taught you go underneath and start the fire. On this case, we're going to start the fire on the top. The fire is going to slowly burn down because the air is coming from down here up through the fire. As it does, it's going to cook the inside container, heating the wood that's in that container, which is sealed except for those holes on the bottom. Now the gases that we cook out of that wood are all flammable gases. Anytime you see smoke, like this smoke right here, you're throwing fuel away. That smoke is fuel. And if you can get it to burn, you're going to turn that fuel into energy. So this is a simple way of doing that. When that inside can, if you can imagine it, starts to cook, makes the gas, the gas has got nowhere to go because the top is sealed. It forces its way out the bottom, comes out in between the cans, ends up getting sucked up between the cans until it hits the coals that are burning here. When it does, it burns. So we're going to burn the gas from the inside can in the wood on the outside of that can, both of which are going to heat the inside can and drive off more and more of that gas. Now the key is we don't let it get much oxygen. That's always the key in pyrolysis. That's always the key in making biochar. However you're doing it is you're going to either eliminate or at least limit the amount of oxygen that's getting to the charge. In a retort system, we're pretty much eliminating the oxygen. We're going to cook that wood on the inside, using the wood on the outside, but not let any oxygen on the inside. That way, it won't burn all the way to ash. It just drives off the gases, but it doesn't burn all the way. If we get it wrong and we got a hole in the top or our seal is bad, we'll end up with a big can of white ash on the bottom about that thick and we've wasted our time. So we get a little fire going here and that fire we're going to push to the sides once it's going. Normally a can of this much 
material would make a lot of smoke. But we're going to burn the smoke to the best of our ability. Now once that gas starts coming out of the inside chamber and comes up into here and meets the fire that's moving down and burning, it's really fascinating because the the gas will use the oxygen first, long before the, the wood will burn. So you'll have wood that will stop burning right here and just burn gas until the inside is all out of gas. And then it'll finish itself by burning the wood down. The beauty of this little design that I like the best is that it's very efficient labor-wise. Once we get this lit and started, we can put the top on it and walk away and it will do its own thing. It's completely self-regulating. You don't have to stand there and wait for it to finish and then put it out. It puts itself out. You can come back tomorrow morning and this will just be a beautiful can of biochar inside and nothing on the outside. What forces the gas out of the holes on the bottom of the inside door? Just, just its own pressure. It's, 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 it's expanding all the time. Okay. The first part of the process, and it's a multi-stage process, is that you're driving the water out of the wood. Okay. okay, so if you can imagine a steam kettle, it's pushing all the time. There's a little bit of pressure and that drives it out the holes. So it's all very natural process, very low pressure, but there's enough pressure. Because we didn't clamp the top on this can, if it actually pressured up, it would just push the top up and the gas would come out and burn right here. It's not gonna pop and explode or anything like that. Yes, sir. Can sitting flat on the bottom of the outer can? Yes. Not propped up on any. No, not propped up at all. If you do prop it up, what can happen then is you'll at the end of the burn, when everything is still hot but all the coals are gone, the oxygen can get back in as things are cooling down, and that'll keep it lit, and then everything inside will turn to ash. So again, this is a really neat system, I think, because you can light it and leave it as long as there's nothing burnable around it, which is why we're doing it in the driveway. Always want to be safe. I have one at home that I've run literally hundreds of times. It's a little bit bigger than this. I call it Old Faithful. And I just come out in the morning and load her up. She's made out of stainless steel. Um, so she's lasted a long time. But I'll load her up like this, light it, cover it, put the stack on it, and go away and come back the next day. I come back the next day, I take out my barrel of char, dump it out, reload the whole thing, light it, and go to work. So each day I, get, I can get a load out of it. Um, and this, this process will probably take three or four hours. So theoretically you could get two loads out of a day if you were that ambitious. At that point you would want to dump the char out and hose it down with water to make sure that it's that it's cooled before you left it alone. Putting it in a pile like this is actually a little bit dangerous, I'm going to warn you. Even when it's nice and cool, there's still chemical processes going on in there. Never assume that the stuff is safe, even when it's cold. You want to wet it down as soon as possible to make sure it's safe. And spread it out if possible. Don't leave it in a big pile. Lots of safety issues, but none of them are difficult. You just have to keep them in mind. Now these are secondary air holes, we call them. And what that will do is if there's any um, residual gas still coming through here and we haven't gotten enough oxygen in from down low, it will pull air in here and burn it before it gets out the chimney. You can hear the fire now. As soon as you put a chimney on it, now you've got the thermal siphon going and it's pulling our primary air in here and our secondary air in here. We've got lots of fire going on right here. It's going to get hot real fast right here. And we'll end up, even with a four foot stack, you'll end up seeing flame coming out of the top of this. But notice what you're not seeing coming out the top of this is smoke. We're going to work real hard to get the balance I think of it like a carburetor in an old style engine, getting the balance between the fuel gas and the air mixture and the right amount of heat and you got a clean burn. You got efficiency.
Hey, I got a question for you. I was just thinking, you know, there's some of us that may want to do something like this uh, more residentially, you know, just in our, around our home. And, it, and if we have a safe area like this, yeah, I'm noticing some of this will blow out every now and then on the top of that stack. That's probably pretty hot. And it it's real hot. Something else and cause a fire. Is there something you might recommend that would some, some sort of a cap? You put a screen over the top. Yeah. I mean, there's, you've got a good draw, draw on there right now. Um, if you want an even better draw, you use an insulated chimney and it goes faster because you're not losing any of the heat out the side of the chimney. Um, but at this point, we'll start at home. I'll put a, a big pan on here and start making spaghetti sauce or something out of my rotten tomatoes. Or use, and that's a matter of using the energy. We've already got number one, we're making the best char we can. Number two, we're using some of this energy if we want. Obviously, we're going to throw a lot of it away. We're wasting a lot of energy with this, but it gets us started. Number three, we're not making a lot of pollution here. If we had just burned that wood, we'd be making a lot more smoke in an open pile than we're making now or if we had thrown it in a can with holes in it, we'd still be making a lot more smoke than we are right now. And that's a matter of getting these holes balanced off with the kind of wood you're doing. There's a lot of tinkering to get it this, this perfect. This will smoke at some point because we'll get, it'll get itself out of balance. When it starts cooking that inside barrel and makes lots of smoke, it won't be able to burn at all and it will exhaust a little bit. So, just so you don't hold me to that too tightly later on, you'll see it happen. And we can even adjust that by popping the top up a little, give it a little more air, and it'll clean it up. And just to give you a, an idea of how much the balance counts for making smoke, if we take this off. Yeah, it's not burning too dirty, but it's because we got this nice dry feedstock, so it doesn't show as well. But you can see the smoke and the stuff coming off of it. It'll pick up as it cools when you got it open like that. Yeah. Smoke will pick up. Even if I put the clamp on that, the top of this can, it's not going to seal it very well. That clamp is made to be used cold with a rubber seal. And we've peeled those rubber seals out because they make lots of nasty smoke, obviously. And so it's just sitting on there. No chance of uh, anything, anything getting out of hand on this. I've done it hundreds of times. Once in a while, you'll get a little whoof if you get a, a burst of gas that mixes and then ignites. It will give you a little whoof. With our, with our big retorts, we've done a lot of experimenting with a lot of different materials. And you can make biochar out of any biological material, pretty much. Um, anything that used to be alive, you can turn it into biochar. You can do it with bones, you can do it with corn stover. I've done it with um, a pretty good feedstock is uh, sunflower stalks. Um, although the key is that if you're looking for carbon by mass, the mass that you're putting in is the mass that you're going to get out. Is is directly proportional to the mass that you're going to get out. Obviously, corn stover, I can pack one of our retorts with corn stover. It's only going to weigh a couple hundred pounds. You're going to get about a third of that back as biochar. So you're only going to end up with less than 100 pounds. Whereas if we st stoke our retort with 2,000 pounds, which is about what we fit in, of this hardwood, we're going to get five, 600 pounds a biochar out of it. So if you're going by weight, then that's important. If you're going by volume if, and you don't care, and then, yeah, use corn stover, corn cobs, um, whatever sticks you got laying around the yard. You know, that pile over there is very inviting to me. Most people see it as a big pile of, of uh, pine that needs to be gotten rid of. To me, it looks like carbon that needs to be sequestered. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to throw this back on, and you can, you can hear it take off with the chimney. 
because that chimney really helps pull the air in and will help the process accelerate. And we'll watch that for the rest of the day or at least for another four or five hours. Later on today we'll, we'll open it up and I'll show you what's inside, which is essentially this. We made this on, in this, so that's what you're going to see. But you can also come over and get closer to it if you get cold especially. It's going to throw a lot of heat. And listen and watch at how much energy is coming out of the top of this thing all day long. That's the energy we're going to try and catch. Right now there's a, there's a big stream of hot air coming out of this, which hopefully is mostly CO2 and water vapor, because that's what we're trying to get to is a clean burn where there's no, um, no particulates and no, um, certainly no carbon monoxide or other emissions like that. Any other questions before we go inside? Can I make a statement about the feedstocks? And that is the number sure. one use of hardwood in, the, in this country is pallets. And pallets get destroyed at a phenomenal rate and they almost all go into the, the landfill. You know, like that pile over there? Exactly. So, so if you've got any sort of a business like a furniture company or anything, somebody's got to create pallets, if, and there, are, there is at least one pallet recycler here, you know, that, that there's a phenomenal uh, array of, of, of feedstock. Yeah, that's a great example of a place to get feedstock. The pallet wood is usually hardwood. It's usually pretty dry. The only thing I would say to be careful of with pallets is what was, what was carried on them if it was uh, chemicals that got spilled or if there were plastic or paint on them. But otherwise, the only other thing is um, the nails that they're put together with. You want to be aware of those. In our process, you've kind of got to get the nails out in order to keep it pure. You can leave nails in and make char if it's going into your garden or something like that. Those nails will rust and break down, but they can also puncture tires and and feet and shoes and yeah. So it's just another thing to be aware of, but it, it is a great source of, of waste wood, uh, real good wood for charring, makes really good char. That's yes, sir. Six, those are six yeah. inch stack? Is that what a six inch That's stack? a six inch stack on there, yep. Yeah. That's special. Um, yeah, you can use eight inch. I use eight inch insulated at home, just cause that's what I can find at the dump. <laughs> and then I just set it on top. But this took me and the guys probably 20 minutes to make with the two cans and no real special tools. In fact, if we have time and people want to see it, we'll make another one while you watch just so you can see how it's done. It's, we've done demonstrations up north where I make these with just a chisel and a hammer and just bang all the holes in that way. I mean, Old Faithful that I discussed before is, is made out of a, a stainless drum that came out of a candle factory. They used to use it for melting wax. And it's about a 100 gallon drum. So I can easily put a 55 inside of that, and that works beautifully. Um, one of the downsides of this is because we're heating that steel so hot on the inside, with these two drums made of regular carbon steel, you're gonna get about 10 runs before you use up one or the other of those drums. It'll just flake off until there's nothing left of that metal and you'll have to get another drum. That gets into the profitability of it. How much does it cost to make the char versus how much is the char worth when it's done? Obviously, it's gonna take a lot longer for the heat to get all the way through this as it is to get all the way through this. So there, is, there are limits, both in small and large. You can't go too small, because if you go too small, what happens is they pack together, and the gases that are on the inside chamber won't get out, and they insulate the center of the batch. So if you put wood chips in that, instead of blocks, you'll end up with a big lump in the middle that isn't charred at all. It'll char in about three or four or five inches, maybe, and then it won't work on the very center of it. So that is an important thing. Um, I love to use sticks because I'm clearing land. So I'm using my slash and I'm running this 
while I'm cutting trees down, I'm packing it and running it on the side and it keeps me warm in the winter because I'm up in Massachusetts and it gets a little cold there sometimes. Would it affect the performance if the chimney, the stack were off to one side so you could maximize the heat surface for cooking? That's a great question. <laughs> it, it might affect it a little bit because the what you want is to get that fire started all the way around the outside so that it burns down evenly. Because if it burns down one side too fast, it throws off the whole cycle. But I'm sure it could be done. I'm sure you could work that out. And because I want you to use the heat. <laughs> I, w I love to see the energy get used. I, and I hate to see it thrown away like we're doing now. Yeah, two, two pots that fit there, right? Or a big round pot with a hole in the middle that fits over the chimney, right? I'm not clear about the feedstock on the outside. Is that becoming biochar at any point in the process? No, that's later? just, that's our, that's our starter material, basically. That's to cook the inside. And uh, so that's, if you figure that into the yield, it's an important factor from that standpoint. By yield, I mean the ratio of what we're putting in to what we're getting out. Yes, sir? Joe, what about the, the ash that's left with the exterior? Can you talk about it? Um, ash doesn't bother me. I've, I've got really acidic soil, and I go around looking for ash wherever I can find it. Uh, so the little bit of ash that's left from the wood burning on the outside, I'm usually just dumping that right in with the biochar that I'm then mixing with my compost that I'm then putting on my soil. Now if you've got really alkaline soil, you might want to be more careful with it and put it somewhere else. But it's, it's not in the same container, so it's easy to do. You can separate it out. The question is, um, What's the maximum cross-sectional area of the feedstock that we could use in this? And that's, a lot of that is uh, dependent on the moisture content, the species, whether it's got bark on it. All of those things will have an effect on it and you gotta play with it. Making biochar is a craft. It really is a craft and you've got to learn all of the pieces of that craft. But roughly, roughly probably three inch would be the maximum that you could ever get out of this. Now my old faithful at home also has a band of insulation around the outside. So I'm really focusing the heat in on that one. It's, it's quite a bit bigger than this. So I've gotta be able to get that heat penetration. And I do that by putting um, aluminum silicate, alumina silicate um, blanket around the outside of it. Don't try it with fiberglass, it'll melt it. So again, there's lots of, I try to inspire you with, to try it, and uh, hopefully you'll have fun with it and not burn yourself or anybody else and, and not upset the neighbors with lots of smoke, and, and that's the challenge. How do you process the chunks of char before you put in your soil? How do I process the chunks of char? All that green and yellow equipment that just came in off the truck is, is for doing that. At home, I put it in the driveway on a piece of uh, plywood and I drive my tractor back and forth across it. At least that's how I used to do it before I, had, before I ramped up my production. And I crunch it up and um, then I shovel it into my compost pit and, and let the compost work with it. What would happen if you threw it in a wood chipper? you would make a cloud of black dust that would cover the whole neighborhood. That'd be bad. I speak from experience. So you could make these things where there's weather disasters? Could you use them to burn the... Oh, there's already people in FEMA working on designs that they can take with them. Again, you've got lots of, in a hurricane disaster or something like that, you've got wood all over the place you've got to get rid of. And you've got energy needs everywhere you go. So if you can convert that wood, that waste that's all around, now you've, you're win-win because you're getting rid of the waste and you're um, creating energy that can be used, hopefully.
at the same time. There's also a lot of pollution in those areas from the disasters. Can the char actually help clean the area right where it was made? Wow, did you prepare these questions beforehand? This is amazing. Uh, I mean, so cool. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Um, yeah, you certainly can. Again, it's, it's a carbon filter. They use it for remediation already. Um, activated carbon is used commonly in remediation where there's oil spills, they use it for that, where there's uh, chemical spills, mercury, all of those things. It'll soak it up. In some cases, they're going to take it after it's contaminated and deal with it, but it will soak the stuff up. In other cases, you're going to um, actually burn the stuff afterwards, so you'd be using the energy at least, even though I hate to see char going up in, in a flame. Like you use it to absorb stuff and then you burn it? Yeah, and in other cases you're going to leave it in the ground because the biology that comes into the biochar is going to keep working on things like fuel oil, if you've got a fuel oil spill. It's the biology they're using to change that oil into something that's not poisonous to humans. So those are all key issues in the environmental aspects. Um, yeah, actually from here, you can see how nice and clean this is burning. And it hasn't started to make its own gas yet, but it will. And it'll start to really rip some more heat than that. Last week, the guys and I put together a little uh, new style invention. At least we thought it was new until we went on the web and found other people already doing it. But that's what lunch is being cooked on right over there. Woof, see, I told you it can woof. This is called a rocket Avila stove. It's similar to what we're doing here, except that that has the ability to feed, feed, uh, feed our starting fuel in the bottom, like a rocket stove, if any of you are familiar with rocket stoves. But it does have the inner chamber with holes in it, so the gases from the pyrolysis that's happening inside can be forced into the center tube and lit with air that's coming in from the bottom, and we're cooking lunch on it and making biochar at the same time. So this is a, a new design that we just decided to try and throw together for today's demonstration. And I'm sure if you try it, you'll come up with other ones. And I really hope that if you do, you'll share them with me and other people so that we can all, as a community, continue to perfect this kind of activity and teach it to the kids and uh, show them all the benefits. And later on, when we're after lunch and after we're, that cools down, we'll open it up and you can see the guts of it and how the flow works and um, how you can put one together yourself if you want to. We're working on this design this week, I hear. Huh? <laughs> this, one? This, this one? This particular model. This particular one because, yeah, the, the wood we're using is different than the wood I use at home. Yeah. So you got to change the you got to change the inputs in order to get it to burn clean. One of the things I've done on one of our later designs is to make those secondary holes variable so I can adjust them during the during the burn. sliding band or something. Exactly. Yeah. So we can uh, review a little bit on the the can if anybody wants to look at the flows in that tin man. In here you can see the inner chamber. And it really happens in two phases. In the first phase, we're getting that inside can hot. Thank you, John. And then in the second phase, it makes the gas, which bubbles out the bottom, comes up into the fire and ignites. This would be the second phase. And we get lots of fire from the gas. Once the gas is gone, and it runs out of gas, that's when the hard carbon is left behind. So it's, the fire then starts to go down, and it finishes burning the stuff on the outside. By the time that gets down, it's really cooked that inner chamber of all of its gas. So that's a big key to making biochar, is to get all the volatiles out of the feedstock. 
That's one way of looking at it, is that we're taking a regular piece of wood and we're going to get the volatiles out of it and leave behind just the solid carbon. So what are the volatiles? It starts with water. The first stage is we've got to get the water out of it. And water takes a lot of energy to move, which is a plus and a minus, depending on how you look at it. <laughs>